Welcome back to DIY Guitar Making. I told you I'd be back for more Q&As in December and I'm a man of my word. I think I kept it because I'm filming this right now on November 27th, which means I will definitely get it out by December 1st. So pretty on top of it here if I do say so myself. So we're going to do our Q&A. Uh, I just want to say that the fall workshops have just ended. That's why we were on pause until now with the videos. And the workshops were absolutely epic and fantastic. I have some awesome pictures, which I'll share with you right now as I'm speaking. From the workshops, we had nine awesome students that came out and we built nine awesome guitars for those students. And, um, oh, at the end of the workshop, we often, but not always, you know, I get different students uh, with different musical abilities, some with none, and some with lots of musical abilities, and we tend to jam sometimes at the end of a workshop after the guitar is built. And uh, I got to have some cool footage of various students jamming and playing their guitars. I will include that either right now or at the end of the the video. I'll decide later when I'm in the editing room for this video. So uh, with that in mind, uh, fall workshops are over. If you missed out on those, try and get in on a spring workshop. This is actually the time of year when people, uh, when they really sign up and fill up quickly. So spring workshops start in April and they end in the beginning of June, I believe. Uh, the end of May, something like that. So, in in the spring, uh, I'll I'll put the uh, schedule on the screen so you can see that. And over the winter, I will not be teaching workshops. What I will be doing is a lot of this, a lot of videos, and I'm going to be building three guitars. I'm going to be building an orchestra model guitar and two parlor guitars. My parlor model is a brand new thing, so that's going to be super cool. All right, let's get to your questions. Okay, this one comes from the Members Forum. Uh, if you don't know what the Members Forum is, the Members Forum is a members access only part of my website, which you get by joining the online course, Building an OM Acoustic. So Frank writes, what is the best way to fabricate a radius radiusing jig and I believe he's actually asking about a radius dish because that is a very common question but radiusing jig is a bit of a misleading term he might be referring to a basically router sled jig that you would use to radius a fretboard or some other fretboard radiusing mechanism I'm gonna assume it's the former and he's talking about a radius dish which this is a question I've answered a number of times, but I'm always happy to talk about it more. But if you want to see those other answers, just look back at previous Q and A's, Frank, and you will see uh, that I've answered this question before. Uh, but let's get into it. So there's uh, a couple different ways to make a radius dish. Number one, go out and buy a CNC machine. I'm just kidding. Uh, but seriously, <laughs> CNC, if you have a CNC machine, that is by far the best way to make a radius dish because it's easy. And that is how manufacturers of luthery supplies make radius dishes. They just use a CNC machine. And so that does actually bring me to a more concrete recommendation because I'm assuming you don't have a CNC. And that recommendation is simply to buy your radius dish. I know that's not why you're asking. You're probably trying to avoid that, but I always buy my radius dishes. They're not that expensive. And if you go down the route of making one, you will find that whichever method you choose, it's gonna be, a, uh, it's gonna take some time. It's gonna be a bit of a pain in the butt and there will be some investment in, well, time, which is what I said, and in resources to even set up uh, either a router sled or something like that in order to make one yourself. So uh, radius dishes are tricky like that and it's often advisable to just buy them. I'm gonna start with that. Now going on from there, I will say there are a couple ways to make it yourself. There's the shim method, which I've talked about before. 
there's uh, a router sled method of making a radius dish, which I've seen a couple people do on YouTube. I've never tried it myself. Actually, I've never tried any of these methods myself because I buy the dishes. But uh, the router sled method and the shim method both look like good ways of doing it. Uh, they both involve some math in order to figure out uh, how to set up your radius. And for that, you're going to have to just look them up. I, I'm not going to go over the math here because I don't keep that in my head. But you're going to have to just look up the shim method for making a radius dish on Google and the router sled method for making a radius dish. Okay? And there's another method. I'm... Oh, yes, there's, there is another method. You get a big Forstner bit and you drill a bunch of holes at various depths and then you carve out your radius dish between the holes. Again, there's math involved to figure out where those holes go and to what depth they go, but that is another method that I've seen. Obviously, it requires a bit more craftsmanship out of the gate, so if you're new to this stuff, I would stick with either the router sled method or the shim method. Since I've talked about it, a good bit this at this point I'll go ahead and explain the shim method a little bit more so you have something more concrete so imagine this imagine you have a variety of shims that you've made that are of different thicknesses you've got some real thin ones and some really thick ones okay you're gonna put the thinnest shim that you have right in the center and glue it down to a flat board okay the center of a flat board and then working outward from there, you're going to take your next largest set of shims and make a concentric ring of them around that first shim. And then another concentric ring of the next largest shims, another concentric ring, on and on, until you have uh, basically a dish shape of these shims onto which you're going to glue down thin flexible, probably about eighth of an inch MDF, okay? And that gives you a radius. Of course, then you just need to figure out the heights of your shims and the distance for them. But Google that. You'll find it. The shim method for making a radius dish. Next question. Okay, Gary Rosquist. Again, from the members forum, writes, I know that Eric made a guitar out of Tiger Myrtle. I recently bought a side and back set from Tasmania of Tiger Myrtle and spent an exorbitant amount of money for it. Yes, Tiger Myrtle, from what I've seen, is very expensive right now. Um, last time I checked, like $750 for a set, at least from a, a particular source. So yeah, it's, it's very expensive wood. Tiger Myrtle, by the way. Myrtle is the wood. Tiger just describes this very gorgeous figure. Uh, it literally looks like the fur of an animal, of a tiger. It's cool. Really cool. But expensive. I won't, going on with this question, I won't even try to use it until I've made a few more guitars. My question is how difficult is that wood to bend? What considerations should I use as far as temperature and other parameters when I bend it? Should I soak it before bending? Any comments or suggestions? Uh, so I've only used Tiger Myrtle one time. He's referring to that one time with that video. And because it has a certain figure to it, and because it's a very unique wood, I'll say, I whenever I get wood like that, where there's a lot of I'm, I'm nervous about it. There's a lot of unknowns. I just, I follow a certain set of parameters, okay? Um, I treat it like it's cantankerous wood, okay? I treat it like it's wood that wants to fracture or get compression marks or something like that. So what I, what those parameters are, are I thickness it, 
down to 75 thousandths of an inch. So that's very thin. I don't like to thickness wood down that thin. I prefer to thickness it to 90 thousandths of an inch, but if it's something exotic and unknown to me, I'll, I fall back on thinning it a little bit more than I usually do, which is 75. You definitely don't wanna go less than 75 because you're entering into territory then where the end product, the guitar itself, the sides will be so thin that they'll be a little bit uh, unstable, right? And, and you're apt to sand through the wood at some portion of the build. So 75 is your absolute thinnest you can take it and still feel good about it. And that will dramatically help the bending process. And then on top of that, uh, with Tiger Myrtle, when I did this, I didn't soak it, I just spritzed it with water. Okay, soaking again, I reserve for woods that are easy benders, like rosewood. Uh, actually, rosewood I, I spritz as well, so that's not true. <laughs> Certain woods are, are fine just to spritz, but um, mahogany and walnut and stuff like that, I will soak. Okay, so that's soaking and spritzing. Um, this, the Tiger Myrtle I spritzed. And then lastly, so he mentioned temperature. Um, temperature, I get it nice and scorching hot. I'm always worried more about breaking the wood than I am about scorching the wood from it being too hot. Although you, either thing can happen, right? So I will get the, the temperature up close to 280 degrees. Uh, if it touches 300, I get really nervous and I, I make sure I bring the dial back down. But for a wood like this, I just get it scorching hot, right? Worst case scenario, I get a little bit of scorching on the outside, uh, which actually sands off, but that's a fine line too. Uh, you can easily get too much scorching if you're going above 300, okay? So, so far we've, we've established Keep it around 280 and spritz it, don't soak, and thickness down to 75 thousandths of an inch. Those are my recommendations. I'm going to read what somebody else wrote about Tiger Myrtle in the members forum. Uh, let's see. David Schiff. Hold on, my phone's acting up. All right. So David responded to Gary's question because he has worked with Myrtle as well. And he writes, The guitar in the photo will be buffed out in a few days. It's made of Myrtle. I don't know the origin of the set, but I suspect it is domestic. From what I see online, Myrtle grows in warm climes. I don't know if it is tiger. I can see why it might be called that. I thought of it more as quilted, like quilted maple. Yeah, so the one in, in the picture here is not tiger myrtle, but um, it's it should be the same species. It should be the same species of myrtle, I believe. Uh, I'm going to double check on this when I'm in the editing room. Going on with this question, I found the wood very easy to bend. Of course, dreads are easier anyway. I didn't soak the sides, just wet them down wrapped in aluminum foil and bent in a side bender. My bender is about 40 years old and works with three 200 watt light bulbs. So I don't know temperatures, I just bend cautiously by feel. By the way, when I played in the white, I thought it sounded fantastic. Almost as bright as maple, but a little warmer. The top is Sitka Spruce from alaskawoods.com. I've used them once before, they're good. A great source. Really good quality at the best prices I've seen. Okay, so that's cool. Um, yeah, I believe that's the same wood, although names are deceiving. I am gonna look that up to see that that myrtle is not just a different species of myrtle, and I'll make a note in this video. But thank you, David, for that, uh, your personal feedback on the tiger myrtle as well, because my experience is very limited. And like I said, honestly, I just treated it in a special category I have in my head for cantankerous woods. I treated it like that, even though it might be a wood that honestly doesn't need to be treated that way. It could be uh, an easy bender, as he said. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, next question in this next one. Mohan Sharma is asking about kerfing 
and whether you level and radius the rim set before you install the kerfing or if you install the kerfing first and then just radius everything like that. The short answer is you want to level the rim set within the radius dish before you install the kerfing. This is because you don't know exactly where that leveling is going to leave everything. And so if you install the kerfing first, when you do that leveling, what you're gonna end up with is in some areas, you will end up radiusing vastly more than you do in other areas. Now this all depends on how you set things up from the get-go. There's different ways to do everything. I'm sure you guys realize that at this point. So these, these questions get a little complicated by that fact. But in general, there's a lot of unknown as to where most of your leveling is gonna happen before you get to that radius dish. So if you install your kerfing first, what you'll end up with is kerfing that in some areas is this thick and in other areas is this thick way way thinner uh, i've actually seen this done before where the kerfing is just kind of barely there in the worst areas so the reason for first taking it to the radius dish is so that your rims are basically where they want to be, right? The, the depth of your tail block and your neck block are set at that point. Then you add your kerfing strips, and at that point you go back to the dish simply to level uh, the tiny bit of kerfing that you left proud to level that down to the sides. And that way you will end up with consistent kerfing all the way around. Okay, next question. It comes from Mark Grimm. Mark writes, Eric, do you sell a separate online course on guitar finishing? Actually, I do, Mark. It's the True Oil course. It's called True Oil Finishing, a Method for Acoustic Guitar. You can find it on my website. But if you buy the online course Building an OM Acoustic, which is my massive uh, 61 video course, it's a huge course, covers all aspects, of guitar building. That course includes the True Oil course, so you might as well buy that and get everything all at once. But I know for some people they just want uh, the True Oil finishing, and I do sell that separately. There you go. Okay, Riggs. Riggs writes, found your channel by watching a guy doing stuff. I love a guy doing stuff. So that's Adam Koakek. I'm terrible with last names. Adam Koakek. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I know a lot of you guys watch him too. He had a very successful YouTube channel. And um, actually, I'd love to ask you guys this. If he's still... I haven't seen him putting anything out. And I know that at one point he quit. He stopped doing it. So if he's out there making videos again, Adam, if you're out there watching this... Uh, I'd love to know because, um, yeah, so he he took my online course and he did his own video series on building an acoustic guitar um, after he took that course. Found your channel by watching a guy doing stuff, soaking up all the coaching and about to embark on a kit build. Great details here on installing the binding and purfling. When you treat the top and back with true oil before gluing binding, do you use one coat or two coats? Yeah, so I just use one coat. The purpose of this, all the finishing techniques that you know and all that that's in your head, just throw that out. The only purpose of applying this coat is to hold down the fibers. It actually doesn't matter if it's true oil or it's lacquer, or sanding sealer, whatever you have in your shop for doing finishing, you can just apply that in the quickest, dirtiest way possible, and that's good enough, okay? Because that coat's just getting sanded off, uh, and, and honestly, just a single coat, in my experience, is enough, okay? So it's not something you need to uh, spend a lot of time on. Uh, I don't even wait the full two hours for the coat to cure and 
it still still is fine. <laughs> so yeah, just wanted to, to add that. Eric, how do you... Okay, Lewis Griffin writes... Uh, this question, by the way, pertains to a video I did where I talk about the clamps that I use for kerfing, which I'm sure you guys are sick of hearing about. <laughs> it comes up a lot for some reason. Um, so he's asking about those clamps that I use to install kerfing. Eric, how do you retain the cutoff rod on the screw jack after cutting them down? Are they plasti-dipped as well? Let me go grab one. So instead of the classic clothespins wrapped in rubber bands, I use little mini C-clamps dipped in Plasti-Dip. So the uh, pads here are dipped in Plasti-Dip and also the cutoff portion of the screw, what he was talking about in the question. That is also dipped in Plasti-Dip and that's all that holds this rod in place. So basically what I do is I grab one of these clamps. Normally this rod is quite a bit longer. I take a hacksaw, I cut it off so it's just this little T-shape, and then this piece here at that point, because I cut the other side off, can just fall out, right? And then you'll lose the piece. We don't want that to happen. So in order to keep that piece, I just dip this in the Plasti Dip along with the two pads here. And the Plasti Dip itself holds that piece together. There you go. Uh, this was very expensive to do and for a very small gain in uh, better gap-free glue joints for my kerfing. Most people are going to use the clothespins wrapped in rubber bands and so that's what I recommend for most people. But this is what I do. Okay guys, well that's it. I will see you guys in the next one. I'm now going to go ahead and get started on those three guitars that I just talked about for the winter season and be prepared for lots of videos and updates on those guitars as I build them and lots of tips and tricks along the way. Bye for now. Hands on the wheel, been driving all night. something here please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video and if you want to really learn more take one of my structured online courses at ericshaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville Pennsylvania